George here. So right now I'm going to continue on with our discussion about virtue ethics. That was uh, the foundations for which were laid by Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics. Right now we're going to talk about Alistair McIntyre's uh, elucidations and uh, further clarification on some of those ideas. Yes? Now, McIntyre acknowledges that there are so many different kinds of virtues that we have. And that leads a lot of people to conclude that does that entail that virtue ethics is somehow relativistic, that anything can be a virtue? Well, last time I tried to uh, illustrate the point that I don't think that Aristotle would suggest that there's a proper way to be a serial killer. There aren't virtuous serial killers, for example. McIntyre uh, isn't going to go in quite in that direction, maybe a little bit. We'll talk about uh, perhaps serial killers in a little bit. But he does say, look at this. Don't we see in so many different societies, however, that there are indeed so many different virtues? He gives several examples. He says uh, Homer, the, uh, the ancient Greek poet, tells us that excellence is a virtue. Why is excellence a virtue? Because it helps us fulfill the social value. He tells us that Aristotle, Aristotle's version of virtue, is the Athenian gentleman. Why? Because it helps fulfill the human purpose. He also gives the example of the New Testament. The New Testament's virtue gives us that virtues are faith, hope, and love. Why? Because it helps fulfill God's uh, purpose for us. Jane Austen he gives us as an example, gives us some kind of virtues, uh, such that constancy and amiability, friendliness, is a virtue. Ben Franklin suggests cleanliness, silence, and industry, and drive, or ambition, I guess, are uh, virtues. Why? Because they help us fulfill uh, material success, or something like that, some sort of notion of success, Protestant work ethic, for example, yes. However, there is, according to McIntyre, a core competency that they all share. They all require some sort of institutional hegemony. That is tradition. Tradition is a virtue, according to uh, McIntyre. What is a tradition, though? He has to clarify this idea. Tradition equals practice. Well, do we remember Aristotle said something like this? Just like the harpist, the musician, has to practice to become a good musician. Aristotle suggested that we have to practice virtue in order to be virtuous as well. McIntyre expands on this idea. Tradition equals practice. But McIntyre is going to focus and expand that idea of practice in a very interesting way, I think. What is a practice? Not practice as a verb, like a musician practices, but rather practice as a noun. What is a practice? He suggests that people within a practice try to achieve the standards of excellence within that practice. He gives us uh, the examples of games. Games have a practice. Farming has a practice. Science has a practice. Arts have a practice. Religions have a practice. Politics has a practice. He likes giving this counterexample, and I think this counterexample is quite uh, uh, illuminating to help us understand what McIntyre means by practice. If you're cheating at a game, for example, if you're cheating, you're not really in the practice. And you're not participating in the virtues and in the tradition and in the practice of that game. So he talks about chess, for example. Why might somebody cheat at a game of chess or at a game of football, right? It's not for football's sake. Or it's not for the sake of chess. It's for the sake of something else. And that shows, according to McIntyre, that you're not really in that practice. You don't understand the values of this particular practice. Of course, each practice has its own good life, its own version of the good life. A good chess player has a notion of the good life, right? A good football player has his own notion of the good life. A good farmer has her own notion of the good life, and so on and so forth. The point is that they are all pursuing excellence within that version of the good life. Yes? 
And to go back to the example of cheating, cheating doesn't illustrate that. If you're cheating, you're not trying to be a great chess player or a great footballer. You're trying to do something else. Maybe, oh, get more money, right? Uh, get more fame, get more honor. All things, if we recall, Aristotle suggested are not the key to a flourishing life. You're not living in the practice. You're not living in the tradition. You're not living in the community when you cheat. So when you are in a practice, you do give obedience to the rules and achievements within that practice that are internal to that practice. And this notion of internal is very important for McIntyre. McIntyre does suggest that there are virtues, therefore, which are necessary for any practice that you wish to follow. Any version of the good life, according to you, does require some sort of virtue. And one of those virtues that you probably need for every practice, according to McIntyre, is humility. Why is humility such a virtue that is probably necessary for every practice? Because you need the humility to say, I'm not good at this yet. Somebody teach me. Give me the wisdom. I want to learn how to become a good chess player. I want to learn how to become a good footballer or a good farmer or a good scientist, so on and so forth. You need the humility to say, I am not at your level, teacher. Please teach me. Please allow me a moment to digress um, and share a personal anecdote about humility and tradition. So one thing that I really like is music. I really love music. I really love playing music. I really love understanding music, especially music I don't understand yet, right? But when I was a kid, I didn't have that humility, right? What do I mean by that? I uh, went to my music teachers. I read the music books, but guess what I always said? Oh, these music books, these teachers, they don't have anything to teach me. I want to be original. I want to do my own thing. I want to do something different. So I don't need to listen to those old fogies and their old music theory traditions. Well, guess what? To this day, I'm still not a great musician because of that early uh, floundering and that early wasted time where I didn't actually listen to my teachers. And I'm still catching up with everything that my teachers taught me before. Uh, would it surprise you? It might surprise you actually to learn now I do pay attention to music theory. Now I'm really trying to understand it. I'm doing just play the right way, will you? And guess what? I can make more original music because I understood the tradition. Because now I understand the tradition. Because now I pay attention to the tradition. Because now I pay attention to the history. Because now I pay attention to the musical institutions. The teachers, the books, music theory. I could actually play music okay. And even better, I make more original music today than I did in my foolish youth, where I wanted to say, oh, they have nothing to teach me. I want to be my own person. Right? Now, maybe that's just an old man talking to you like this, but that is a lesson that I've learned, such that it seems to me McIntyre and Aristotle are teaching us, oh, humility does matter. Tradition does matter. Just shut up and listen for once in your life, you stubborn, frustrated kid that's so, uh, yeah, wants to be a pain in the neck. <laughs> um, yeah, I got to tell you that I do wish I listened to my music teachers a lot more way back then than today. I, I, I can't imagine how good I'd be, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, that's frustrating, but it's a lesson learned. That's how these things go, isn't it? So there are a number of virtues that McIntyre is going to suggest contribute to us, to us achieving the goals within any practice. Humility is one of them. Relationships and fostering relationships. We need relationships in any version of the good life, don't we? You need the relationship to go to a teacher and say, 
ah, yes, I need to learn from you. Let's, I like the chess example. Let's imagine that you're pursuing the good life of a chess grandmaster. You need the relationship to meet an opponent and say, we are in this practice together. Let us share our wisdom and compete in this match. Let's see this. So relationships are going to be important in any practice. Now, I hear some people say, no, 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 I want to be a loner. I want to go to the mountains and uh, live off the land, so to speak, and be a complete hermit or uh, an ascetic. I think McIntyre is going to say, to respond, to try to fill in some gaps here, I think McIntyre might say, yeah, but don't, doesn't that require a humility to nature? Doesn't that require a humility and creating relationships with the nature around you. If you are going to live in the mountains all on your own, don't you have to respect nature? Don't you have to respect the seasons, let's say? So I think even if you do want to be that loner and isolate yourself, you still need certain virtues, certainly humility, and the relationships that you're going to need to create with the nature around you. So despite the fact that... Um, some people might try to throw that back at McIntyre. I think there is a response to that. That no matter what we are doing, we do need the virtue of humility and the virtue of forming strong relationships with others. Other examples of virtues that McIntyre mentions are truth, justice, courage, right? You need to speak truth with others in order to communicate with them, in order to develop this flourishing life within whatever your version of the good life is. You need truth, and you need to depend on others to speak the truth. You need the courage to go out and do these difficult things. You do need some sense of justice, some sense of right and wrong. So even if you're, going back to McIntyre's chess example, you need some example to say, uh, that's a wrong move. That's not the right thing to do if you are playing uh, chess, and how to respond to injustices or wrong things. So justice, courage, truth, those are three more examples, in addition to the earlier one of humility, that McIntyre suggests are three virtues that, no matter what your version of the good life is, those are going to be necessary virtues across all versions of the good life. Now, to be sure, you've seen that I've already kind of uh, responded to somebody who's going to be an individualist or to, who strives for individualism. McIntyre is going to say that that modern liberal individualism is certainly missing and is certainly wrong about certain things. We do need each other. You can't be an individualist and follow virtues like this. You can't be an individualist and have a good life in the ways that Aristotle and McIntyre are talking about. McIntyre stresses the role of history. History is here and historical institutions are here to teach us about some version of the good life. Right now, I've talked about chess a little bit, but imagine this. No matter what society you grew up in, you didn't choose that as an individual to be born in that society. You were instilled with certain historical virtues and certain historical versions of the good life, such that you all have to, we all have to appreciate those historical institutions that we were born in. Now, is he saying that all institutions are perfect? Of course not. But he is saying that for our own striving and your own striving of the good life, we do need to respect history. And he says history is moral history. What lessons are we learning? What lessons are you focusing upon? That is an important part of discovering the good life and realizing a good life. Now, what does McIntyre suggest? Yes, within certain institutions, we can only understand a flourishing, virtuous, good life within certain institutional frameworks, historical institutional frameworks. And those virtues are internal to some version of the good life. 
whatever your practice is. But what does that say about what he calls external goods? Let's go back to the example of cheating. The uh, footballer, let's say, who cheats because he wants to win the game. What McIntyre suggests is the cheater within any practice. The cheater is not enjoying and is not practicing and is not participating in the internal goods within some virtuous framework. Rather, they are trying to appreciate some goods that are external to that virtuous practice or the virtues of that practice, rather. So the cheater is going towards the external, striving for the external rather than the internal goods that are internal to some version of the good life or some practice. McIntyre has to acknowledge, and this is what I like about a good philosopher, he has to acknowledge that, yes, I don't like it when people strive for those external goods like money, like fame, like power. And Aristotle said the same thing. But McIntyre is honest because he says, even though I don't like that, he understands it. He does understand it. We do need some degree of external goods, don't we? We do need some external resources. I need food to live, right? I need sometimes money. Sometimes the, the pull of those external goods that the cheater strives for are a necessary part of life. Now, what does McIntyre say about that? Of course we need those external goods, right? But is that going to lead to a good life, to a flourishing life, to a virtuous life? McIntyre is going to say, no. That's not really a good life, is it? When you're enjoying the internal virtues of some version of the good life, of some practice, you are not really dealing with the consequences, McIntyre says. What does that mean? I think what that means is a good game of chess. Let's say you're trying to become a chess grandmaster. The grandmasters, the greatest grandmasters, the people who are really flourishing in some chess, in the chess world, let's say, they're not really concerned about winning. They're not concerned about the consequences of a match. Rather, they're probably a lot more concerned about what do I learn here? What am I getting here? What am I teaching others? What am I learning myself about this world of chess? Now, I like the chess example, but you pick your version of the good life. Whatever your version of the good life is whatever practice you choose to follow. That's what McIntyre is saying where we should be striving for and wouldn't that be a flourishing life? When you are concerned about the goodness of and the goodness within that practice, that's when you're really living a flourishing life, a life of unity. Certainly we are concerned with those external things, McIntyre admits. But isn't it so much better? Have you ever? Now, forgive me. There is a difference, isn't there? When you, when we, when I read a book because it was assigned to me to pass some class. We've all done that, right? And why did we do it? We did it because of the external good. Right? We did it because of the external good where we said, I I've got to pass this class. Why do you want to pass the class? Why do you want to get the degree? Um, Aristotle reminded us because uh, I want to live a good life, because I want to be happy, yada, yada, yada. But this, there's always these classes where we're assigned a book that we don't want to read. And why do we read? And maybe we are uh, uh, motivated to cheat in that kind of class. Because we're more interested in the external. And is that class very worthwhile? Aristotle and McIntyre would probably say no, right? Now let's contrast that with a book that you actually did like to read. You forgive me. I like reading. 
I like uh, reading not just philosophy, but all sorts of other things too. Yeah. Uh, Japanese literature. Uh, I like reading about music. I like reading about lots of different uh, things, certainly economics, politics, those sorts of things. If you don't like reading, um, try to picture your own version of this. But isn't there a difference when you read a book that you really wanted to learn from? When you're reading something that you really enjoyed reading? Not because it was assigned to you, but because you said, I see that book. That book looks like it's going to contribute to my version of the good life, whatever that version is. Because I really love, well, forgive me, chess. McIntyre's example. I really want to read about chess. And so I'm reading this book about chess or about philosophy in my case. I also like reading books about music. Why do I read these books about music? Because I like understanding music. Not because I want to pass a music class. Isn't there a difference? I think there is. And I think that's what McIntyre's talking about when he's talking about internal goods versus external goods. Yeah, we've all read that book or taken that class that we didn't really want to take. For some external reason, we took it or read it. But isn't there a great feeling? And isn't that contributing to the good life when you read that book? that you actually wanted to read, that you actually learned something from, that you're actually engaging with. Now, I understand. Uh, we don't always read those books, but sometimes we do. Let's imagine baseball or football. McIntyre brought up football. I used to play uh, soccer as a kid, European uh, world football, yeah? I hated practice when I was a kid. Oh, practice! Who likes practice? I got to do this again and again and again. As a child, I didn't have and enjoy the virtues of that sport. But when you do actually want to flourish, let's say as a footballer, don't you actually enjoy practice in a certain way? Now, of course, some people are like, oh, no, I hate practice. I always hate practice. Fair enough. Perhaps there's that feeling. But don't you do it because you know that there's something to it. And you want to practice the right way. And maybe it's not football. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's something else. But McIntyre is suggesting that if you're living a good life, there is something that you want to do for the internal goodness of that thing. Not for the external goodness. Not for the external goods, such as money or fame etc, etc, etc. And so McIntyre says that this is really the key to a good life, is following such virtues. The virtues of truth, courage, justice, humility, and let's say diligence. Don't we all need diligence and persistence and perseverance, no matter what our practice is? And isn't that going to lead to a good life? McIntyre says something that might rub some people the wrong way. He says, a life without such virtues is going to be a defective life. If you're only chasing the external goods and not some version of the good life that has goods that are internal to some practice, to some version of the good life, that's going to be a defective life. That's going to be an incomplete life, he says. But why? He does give some reasoning here. Because you're always going to have some conflicts, aren't you? There's always going to be a life filled with more conflicts. There's going to be too much arbitrariness if you're only chasing the external goods. But if you do have some version of the good life, you will have a more unified life that gives your life purpose, that gives you purity of heart. And McIntyre says we need that unity of life, don't we? Now, how do we figure that out? Oh, of course, that's hard. I remember the Aristotle who said, yeah, living a virtuous life is hard. Finding the virtues is hard. But isn't that a better life when you do find the version of the good life that you're after? Some version of the good life.
to participate in. See you next time. Bye-bye.